We've seen how we can derive a compensated demand curve, a demand curve that tells us how much a consumer would consume if she was always compensated to reach the original indifference curve that she started on. So here we have a consumer that starts on the original indifference curve UA at the optimal bundle A. She's consuming that much of X1 at the original price P that creates this original budget line. And then when we increase the price to some higher price, that made the budget constraint steeper. We shifted it up to be tangent to the original indifference curve to compensate the person, reach the point B, and then we brought down that point B and we said, well, that's how much the consumer would consume of the good X1 at this higher price if we compensated her. And then we could connect these and that gave us the compensated demand function or the compensated demand curve, assuming we keep you at the original utility level UA. We now want to ask a different question. We'd like to know, what's your marginal willingness to pay for each of the goods that you're actually consuming? And each of the goods that you're not consuming because your marginal willingness to pay is less than what the price is. So here we have a consumer who's again consuming at the original optimal bundle A, at the original price. We put dollars of other consumption here. And so the slope of this budget constraint is just minus the price of good one. So at that price, we're consuming this much of the output. That price is how much this consumer was willing to pay for the last unit of good X1 that she bought. That's where this tangency is happening. So if we want to put the marginal willingness to pay on this axis, we know that the marginal willingness to pay for the last good that she purchased was just that original price, P1. Now we want to ask, well, what was her marginal willingness to pay for the first unit given that she's consuming at this bundle? So we'd want to go up her indifference curve to that first unit and see what the marginal rate of substitution here is. That marginal rate of substitution is how many dollars of other consumption she's willing to give up to get one more unit of this good or, or that first good. So this marginal rate of substitution is now equal to the marginal willingness to pay for that first unit. So that would be somewhere up here for that first unit she's willing to pay what that slope of that indifference curve is. What about the second unit? Well, for the second unit, we have a shallower slope since we have diminishing marginal rates of substitution. So the dollar she's willing to give up to get one more unit has fallen. We've got a new marginal rate of substitution. That gives us a new marginal willingness to pay for that second unit. And we could similarly plot what the marginal rate of substitution here is, which is now equal to her marginal willingness to pay, and just get this downward sloping curve that gives us her marginal willingness to pay for the good X1, given that she's consuming at bundle A. And that marginal willingness to pay will go below the price because the slope, the marginal rate of substitution, becomes shallower than the original budget constraint for units beyond what, where she stopped consuming. So we have now what we call a marginal willingness to pay curve. It tells us how much she was willing to pay for the first unit, for the second unit, third unit, and so on and so forth. But notice what we've done. We've just taken slopes, tangencies here, and plotted them here on these axes, which is exactly what we did when we derived the compensated demand curve. We simply took a compensated budget, found the tangency, and that slope became the price here, and that's how we got that compensated demand curve. So it turns out that compensated demand curves are just marginal willingness to pay curves. So if we are given then a marginal willingness to pay curve or a compensated demand curve for the good X1, where we measure dollars here, we get a marginal willingness to pay curve and the consumer is currently consuming at some bundle A at this price, we can now derive the total willingness to pay 
for all of these units of x1 that she bought. We just have to add up the marginal winners to pay for the first unit, for the second unit, for the third unit, and so on and so forth. This entire area, A plus B, this triangle up here and this rectangle down here, is the consumer's total willingness to pay, TWTP, total willingness to pay, for all of her consumption of X1. So that would be equal to area A plus B. But she only had to pay the price times the quantity. She only had to pay that rectangle B. So that's why we will say that her consumer surplus, how much better off she is for being able to purchase in this market at this price, is equal to the difference between what she would have been willing to pay for all these units and what she actually had to pay, which was just this little area B. So if we subtract uh, what she actually had to pay from what she was willing to pay, we just end up with the little area A. So the consumer surplus then is the area above the price up to the marginal willingness to pay curve. In Econ 101, you might have learned that the consumer surplus is the area above the price up to the demand curve. And that's true when the demand curve is equal to the marginal willingness to pay curve, which we now know is true when good x1 is quasi-linear. But in all other cases, the marginal willingness to pay curve, the compensated demand curve, is a different curve than the uncompensated demand curve. So measuring consumer surplus on the uncompensated demand curve would over or underestimate how much the consumer surplus is, depending on whether the good is, 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 is normal or inferior. Remember that there's an additional income effect that makes the demand curve either shallower or steeper. And so measuring consumer surplus on regular demand curves will give us an incorrect estimate of consumer surplus unless x1 is quasi-linear.